Okay, let me briefly introduce you. Ekin graduated from Marmara University Physics Department. Uh, he started his master's degree at Boston University. Uh, during this time, he worked on uh, charm signs and string theories. Currently, he is a master's student at Vienna University Mathematics Department. He will talk about categories and topological quantum field theories. Uh, Ekin, I will warn you at the last five minutes, uh, you can start whenever you're ready. Um, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. As Najce said, uh, I will be talking about categories and topological quantum field theories. Um, there is a lot to cover, so let's quickly get started. Uh, first, let me, let me mention about the, the overview. Um, I will start with uh, motivation for GKFT after giving uh, the, uh, some motivation for GKFT. I will ask the question, what do we expect from metropological quantum field theory? And, and to, to understand this, I will give uh, some example of uh, quantum field theory and try to, we will try to guess what uh, a TKFT can be. And, and later, I will try to um, define topological quantum field theories. And to do this, we need some machinery because I will uh, try to use a functorial definition of TKFT. So I will define categories and functors. And later I will talk about symmetric monoidal uh, structures on categories and, and functors between them. Uh, in this part, I will not have enough time to, to cover it properly, but um, I will cheat a lot and I will try to give some uh, intuition towards uh, what, what they are. I mean, to be honest, I will cheat a lot in, in all the other parts too, but <laughs> I will cheat more here. Um, and the, the last thing will be to, to give definition of uh, TKFTs. And TKFT is, as you guess, uh, short for topological quantum field theories. So I wrote, uh, I wrote three things for uh, motivation. One can find many more motivations to work on TKFTs, but uh, first motivation I wrote is uh, mathematical rigor. Uh, TKFTs can be described by axiomatically and it's, it is mathematically well understood. So it serves as a bridge between physics and mathematics. We can use the topological quantum field theories to find out more about uh, uh, topological invariance of, um, of algebraic topology of some topological spaces. Um, yeah, and, and it also gives us a way to uh, axiomatize quantum field theories. Um, and it actually takes us to the second motivation idea. Uh, it is a simple toy model for quantum field theories. In a standard quantum field theory, we have to uh, solve a lot of complicated equations, but uh, in TQFD instead, we just describe most of the information. We are only interested in topological information. So that's why it's very simple. Uh, it doesn't give you much information, but it gives you an overview of, uh, of quantum field theories. And this is my mo main motivation to work on this subject, actually. And, uh, it is, and the third uh, motivation is uh, we can compute non-perturbative effects on quantum field theories. So it's not only mathematical, mathematical, mathematically rigorous, and it's not only helping us like a simple toy model to understand QFTs, but it actually helps us to uh, compute some, some stuff in, in quantum field theories, especially uh, topological phases of uh, matter uh, quantum matters and actually Rak Shahino will talk about this, I guess, in the last talk on, on Sunday. And also uh, today in the morning, uh, Petro talked about John Simon's theory and, and, and so on. And he even mentioned about cooperatism classes and we will uh, go a little deeper on, on those subjects. So they all are uh, some motivations for those. And later um, today, Niels will talk about uh, two dimensional uh, topological quantum field theories with defect and without defect. So I think this uh, lecture will be uh, introductory for, uh, for, for the other talks. And if the 
if the other talks were uh, quite complicated uh, for many of the audience, this will be, I think, easier to understand, I hope. Um, yeah, let's continue. So in a standard quantum field theory, we start with a, uh, with a field configuration phi and an action. And in the path integral approach, actually, we try to calculate the, the path integral. And uh, path integral is given by uh, in integration over all possible fields with the weight e to the i s phi. And s phi is a functional of, of, of phi. Um, and physical observ ob uh, observables for such a system is given by this formula. We just insert uh, the, the physical quantity here, and, and then we can find the find, uh, expectation value of physical observables. And in fact, if, uh, if uh, expectation value of physical observables turn out to be metric independent, although your theory, when you started constructing your theory, you start with a metric, uh, in the end, you end up with a topological quantum field theory. And I assume for people who work on particle physics, that's how they, um, that's how they confronted with the, with the topological quantum field theories. And in, in, in integration, you, at least like when I learned quantum field theory, you get the term and you say, this is a, uh, this is a topological term because this is about how many times you wind, uh, um, your system or whatever. And um, so I will give one example for this, one dimension example. And by one dimension, I mean dimension of the work line, work sheet, or uh, particle work volume of, of our particle. Uh, so it is a, a one particle system in an n dimensional space time, we can think of it. And it is nothing but uh, quantum mechanics, as we know. And um, and for such a system, let's assume at time t0, we have a, a point particle in some, in some point in the space time. I do not this point with pi in, but we can just also write coordinates here instead, but to make it look more general, uh, I just uh, wrote pi in. And after time t, at time t1, uh, we have a we have uh, outgoing field configuration, and our aim is to compute all possible paths from this point to that point. Um, and in other words, we, we, we are interested in time evolution. And we know that uh, at time, any time t, any time t, we have a Hilbert space. We have a space of states in, in that point, and uh, and time evolution is nothing but just a map uh, from Hilbert space in this point to Hilbert space in that point. And, and time evolution is given by this. And if our action is uh, time independent, we can find out from this formula that this, uh, this operation is nothing but just operation of uh, e to the minus i uh, h t1 minus t0. So like uh, standard, uh, time evolution operator of quantum mechanics. Um, yes. Now we expect ourselves a uh, question. What is what do we expect from my topological quantum field theory? And, and I draw a similar picture here. I mean, as you can guess, these pictures are like, this picture is only two dimensional, but we try to again, think of it as n dimensional thing. Um, and here, our physical system at time t0 again is given by uh, phi in, and phi in is uh, just a field. Uh, it's just representing the physical system in a special slice sigma in. And after some time t, we get another uh, field configuration phi out uh, in a special uh, slice sigma out. And we are again interested in all possible paths from time uh, from, from the sigma in to sigma out, namely. Um, and to formalize this, we can say for any n minus one dimension manifold sigma, we expect to get a Hilbert space for this point, right? Um, and once we, once we have the Hilbert space, we can, we can talk about how do we insert time evolution? 
and this is the second thing we expect from a GKFT. Um, for any n-dimensional manifold M with boundary sigma in and sigma out, or in boundary sigma in, out boundary sigma out, as we have time evolution here, uh, we have an orientation. Uh, we want to get a linear map from these two Hilbert spaces or from these two vector spaces. Um, and another property we expect is locality. Um, it, it means that if I if I go from sigma in to sigma out, but if I make a, if I take an intermediate space sigma sigma t, uh, going from here to there should be the same thing as going first here and and there. And and uh, so if 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 I compose these two manifolds and this composition. Uh, we will define later. If I compose these two manifolds, if I glue them together and, and map it to uh, to this linear map here, it should be the same thing as first applying uh, this this map Z first. Uh, so taking ZM2 and then later ZM1. Uh, that's what we uh, require from a TKFT. Um, another uh, thing we expect is that if let's take a look at this picture if uh, if our incoming uh, sigma in is a disjoint union of two uh, n minus one dimensional manifolds uh, then we expect to get a we expect our Hilbert space at this point again here is uh, time t0 let's say we expect our Hilbert space to decompose to a uh, tensor product of these two uh, uh, Hilbert spaces in this point and Hilbert space in that point. And lastly, we expect to uh, have a non-degenerate pairing so that we can actually talk about measurement. And this non-degenerate pairing is a map from um, tensor, tensor, second tensor product of Hilbert spaces to complex numbers. Um, yes, uh, the rest of the lecture will be uh, more mathematical structures, and in the end, we will define the tick, we will define the Boltzmann quantum field theory, and we will see that uh, our definition is matching with what we expect here. And as I will uh, define TKFT with with. Uh, uh, I will give functorial definition of TKFT. Uh, I will first define categories and functors. So a category C consists of a set of objects of op C and it is, it is denoted by op C and morphisms between uh, these objects. Um, and so we have these objects and we have morphisms between them. And we want that these morphisms should be uh, should be composable. So if I go from A to B and then go from B to C, it should be the same thing as going from A to C. This is a requirement. And this composition should be uh, associated. That's also what we, what we require. And we also want to have a, a identity morphism for each object. So for object A, I want to have a special morphism, identity morphism, denoted by 1a. Uh, and when I compose this 1a with other morphisms, it shouldn't change other morphisms at all, uh, usual identity. So we uh, require very, very little things from, from category. Uh, and that's the, the difficult part of it. When you think of it, you have objects, morphisms, associated composition, and identity. and uh, any mathematical structure I can think, I can endow them with such a structure. So anything can be category. And that's the difficult part of category, <laughs> category theory, I would say. So that's why it gives you an overview of, of mathematical structures also. And if you are seeing this definition for the first time, it might take uh, a little bit time to, to sink in. Um, but again, as, as, as you see, it is uh, very simple and it is, uh, very little requirements. Um, let's give some examples of categories. Um, simply any set with additional structure 
and stru structure preserving maps can be made into a category. So one example is group. Uh, groups are sets with group products such that it satisfies group uh, properties, right? And we can think of uh, groups as um, objects or objects, uh, groups as objects and uh, group homomorphisms as morphisms. And it makes, uh, it, it, uh, it gives rise to a category of groups. Also, topological spaces can be made into a category. Uh, objects are topological spaces and morphisms are uh, structure preserving maps and our structure is uh, topology. So we need continuous maps as, uh, as our morphisms. Uh, another example is K-vector spaces. Um, objects of uh, objects are K-vector spaces and morphisms are linear maps. Uh, again, in, in, in both these three examples, we have to check if the composition is well-defined if we have the identity morphism for each element and if the composition is associated. But these are somehow trivial. These we know that um, we can uh, compose linear maps uh, in, in vector spaces. Um, and unit element is just the identity map. And we know that uh, uh, composition of linear maps is associated. Um, another example of, of categories would be smooth manifolds. Uh, category of smooth manifolds and its objects are smooth manifolds and morphisms are smooth maps simply and smooth maps are uh, preserving the structure of smoothness simply. Um, one non-obvious example of category is category of bordism classes. Um, objects of this category is n minus one dimensional closed oriented manifolds without boundary. Let's call them uh, sigma zero and sigma one. And now we have to check what are the maps between those n minus one dimensional manifolds. Um, and the morphisms are defined to be orientation preserving diffeomorphism classes of oriented n, di n dimensional manifolds. Um, first of all, we need orientation because because uh, we will consider these morphisms, uh, these, these manifolds as maps, for, maps from uh, one manifold to another. Uh, so we have to be able to talk about in boundary and out boundary. And in, a, in, in our physical theory, uh, this n minus n dimension manifolds will represent uh, time evolution. So, and time has a direction. So that's why we need orientation. And uh, note that we are uh, we are also requiring uh, not not uh, any manifold between them, but we, we are uh, interested in uh, diffeomorphism classes of, of these manifolds uh, whose in boundary is sigma zero and whose in out boundary is sigma one. Um, composition of morphisms uh, uh, is pulling the manifolds along the, uh, the common boundary. And this operation is given by this. Um, so if I have uh, a manifold M1 whose in boundary is sigma zero, whose out boundary is sigma, sigma prime, um, and another one whose in boundary is sigma prime and out boundary is sigma one, uh, and the other one is M2, we can uh, glue them as M1 disjoint union M2 quotient by a uh, common boundary. Uh, but the thing is, um, we should be very cautious here because we are not talking about uh, any manifolds. We are talking about uh, diffeomorphism classes of those manifolds. One should show that uh, this composition is well-defined. And what I mean by well-defined is that uh, so M1 is a representative of this diffeomorphism class, right? If I take one representative of uh, this diffeomorphism class, and one representative of this diffeomorphism class, I get a manifold M, and I take its, um, its again, uh, diffeomorphism class. But if I take another uh, uh, representative of it, and another represent representative of M2, then I should get the same diffeomorphism class. It is, in fact, the case, but it is, uh, it is not 
that obvious that this is well defined. Um, it, it, you have to use quite a lot of um, tools of, of differential geometry to be able to show that this is well defined. But I will, if, if you are interested on this, you can um, you can check out uh, some of the um, references. Um, so we defined objects of this category. We defined morphisms of this category. We defined composition. Associ uh, associativity of this composi composition is quite obvious, I think. It's a disjoint union and quotient map, and yeah, I think uh, and yeah, you when you uh, compose it with another manifold, then you co you quotient it by uh, another n minus one dimensional manifold. So it should it will always be associated, mm -hmm. and and for any n minus one dimension manifold, we have to define um, identity morphism. An identity morphism is defined to be a topological cylinder. In other words, uh, sigma zero, like identity map for sigma zero is sigma zero times just interval uh, between zero and one. And uh, the feomorphism class of uh, this guy here is, the, uh, is our identity map. Um, I wrote here too, and I should again say that this is uh, not an obvious, uh, intuitively it, it looks clear, it looks simple, but it is not an obvious construction that uh, they can, they, they are actually well defined. And one remark here, uh, I also uh, saw in Petro's notes, he was using the word cobordism. Uh, in the literature, some people say bordism, some people say cobordism. Uh, they are exactly the same thing. They are just two different words for, for the exact same thing. Mm. Yes. Uh, now, as, since we have defined categories, one uh, natural question is that what are the morphisms between, between what are the maps between uh, categories? And maps between categories are called functors. And let's, let's define them. A functor F uh, from a category C to a category D is a family of maps between objects and morphisms. So in, 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 in a category, we have both uh, objects and morphisms. So this functor should map both objects and, and, and morphisms. Um, objects of them are usually mapped and, uh, and uh, morphisms of this category is mapped to morphisms of this category. Uh, this is again clear. And we had uh, composition and identity. We should also, uh, we also require from a functor to, to be compatible with, it, uh, with the composition and it should map the identity element to identity element. It means that if I uh, take a morphism and uh, compose it with uh, another morphism in the category C, it should, and then uh, apply the functor it should be the same thing as uh, applying the functor first to the morphism and then uh, applying the other one, uh, applying functor to the other morphism too, and then taking composition in the, in the second category, in the D, uh, it should be the same thing. And if I uh, also take identity morphism for an object A, it should be mapped to identity morphism of FA. FA is again an object, and uh, identity is the uh, is the identity map with respect to composition. Um, yes, let's let's give some examples again. Um, actually, there are some uh, obvious examples somehow. Uh, one can construct a functor from a category of again, some set with additional structures and structure preserving maps, uh, morphisms between them. So it's underlying sets and underlying morphisms uh, by only forgetting the structure, but leaving the underlying sets and morphisms untouched. For example, uh, category of vector spaces. Uh, what is it? It's again a set with, uh, with an addition and multiplication with, uh, with a scalar, right? Uh, you map all this set 
to its underlying set, but you lose all the uh, all the information about addition and uh, and multiplication by scalar. This this is in fact uh, sort of even obviously com compatible with like this structure. So uh, this is a functor. Again, another example of functor is uh, a map from category of groups to category of sets. Um, category theory was first arise from algebraic topology. So that's why I wanted to give an example from, an alge from algebraic topology, although it will not be used in the rest of this talk. But again, I think for those who are interested in it, interested in homology groups, cohomology groups, this should be quite simple and uh, it should give some intuition to you. Uh, if I have two topological spaces, M and N, and if I have a continuous map between them, and this is actually morphism of, of the category top, uh, then this continuous map here induces uh, a homomorphism of its un their underlying homology groups. And these homology groups are, uh, are abelian groups. So thus, uh, HN is uh, actually mapping topological spaces uh, to abelian groups. And it's also mapping uh, this, this continuous maps, continuous functions to uh, group homomorphisms. Uh, so the fact that F star is a group homomorphism here, that this continuous map induces a group homomorphism, it makes it into a, into a functor. Um, yes. Are there any questions about categories or functors? Well, I guess not. Okay, nice. Uh, then I can uh, continue with um, monogal structure. So I, I, I want to first motivate uh, monogal structure on, on categories. And for this, I will use tensor product and and uh, and the string union operator. So a tensor product uh, between a tensor product of two vector spaces is defined as the unique universal object of bilinear maps. I assume that we we all know what a tensor product is somehow, um, and we know that tensor product is associative, bilinear, and it has a unit. So I can take tensor product of these uh, three spaces in two, uh, in two different way, and I will get the same thing. These are isomorphic. And likewise, uh, I can, uh, I can, I can um, so V is a K vector space. I can tensor it with the, its underlying um, field K, and it is the same thing as the V itself. And I can also multiply it from, from the other side. Um, and by the same thing, I mean isomorphic. And this will be important later somehow. Um, and we can also take tensor product of linear maps. Uh, and it is, uh, if I have a linear map from V1 to V2, and if I have another uh, linear map from V1 prime to V2 prime, then tensor product of these two maps are just defined component-wise. So F is acting on the first variable and G is acting on the second variable. Um, and simply I can compose them uh, again. Um, I can, co composition of uh, these linear maps is just the composition of the F after F prime tensor G uh, after G prime. Um, and we also have a unit of this tensor product, tensor product space. If V1 tensor V2 uh, unit of uh, this space, V1 tensor V2 is defined as uh, identity of V1 tensor identity of V2. Um, actually, when you think of it, tensor product is a is a map from V1 times V2 to another vector space. So it is some sort of functor uh, which takes two objects and splits 
one object uh, of category of k vector spaces. And tensor product is also um, uh, a map from uh, two morphisms to simply one morphism of the tensor product space. Um, another, and yes, and the last thing is about tensor product is that uh, tensor products are symmetric in the sense that V1 tensor V2 is isomorphic to V2 tensor V1. Mm. Another tensor-like uh, operation is disjoint union. Uh, again, disjoint union is a map from uh, 2n minus 1 dimension manifold to 1n minus 1 dimension manifold. Uh, and again, disjoint union is uh, clearly associative. And uh, I can I can choose identity of this disjoint union to be empty set if I take uh, disjoint union of sigma with empty set, it, nothing will change. Uh, it will be isomorphic to to sigma itself. Uh, and picturally, we can also see that the, the morphisms of uh, of this category. We can also take uh, this joint union of, of uh, these two morphisms. So if I have sigma in is uh, sigma one, this joint union sigma two, and uh, sigma out is sigma one prime, uh, this joint sigma two prime, then the, the morphism between these two uh, spaces would be this joint union of morphisms of each object. Um, yes, and we will try to uh, endow our categories with this tensor product like structure. And for this, let me give you a definition of strict monoidal uh, categories. Um, as, we, as we did in both tensor product and, um, and disjoint union, a strict monoidal category C is a category together with a functor uh, denoted by tensor product here from C times C to C and an element one, which is an object of C such that uh, tensor product is associative and uh, I can multiply this one from left to right and it will be the same thing. Uh, but the, the, this doesn't mean that the, the, the problem is the Let's go back here. Uh, the problem is that here I require that they should be equal, but in the definition of uh, when we talked about tensor products, they are not actually equal, they are, but they are isomorphic. Um, we can also change these equalities here with uh, isomorphism somehow, but we didn't even define what isomorphisms of uh, functors are, right? Uh, so that's why I will be cheating here a bit. And, uh, and I will, let's, um, let's go to real monoidal categories. Um, I'm not defining what a natural isomorphism is or, uh, but, it should be uh, isomorphisms of functors in some sense. And, and it, it brings us a problem that if I, um, mm, so this is nothing but this uh, equality in the previous page is replaced by this natural isomorphism. And again, for from uh, multiplying tensor taking tensor product of, of an object with an identity is again isomorphic and this lambda is the isomorphism map in this sense, but it only brings up a problem. So we have to require that a monoidal category satisfies uh, this diagram because when you think about it, when you have uh, four tensor, uh, four uh, objects of the category and, and, and when you, uh, when you transfer them, there are two ways to go from here to here. You can take this path and you can take this path. And we have to require that these are coherent. Going 
from here to here, from this way is the same thing as going from here to here. Uh, but it is not a very complicated thing, I think. Uh, it is just a, a monodist structure with extra condition and these natural isomorphisms came into play, but they are just uh, isomorphisms of functors sympathy. But again, we didn't define them, so I'm a little uh, cheating here. Um, yes, also we saw that tensor products of vector spaces are, uh, are symmetric. So A tensor B in the vector spaces in the vector spaces are isomorphic to B tensor A. Uh, so, so I can define uh, this structure to two categories too. Uh, a monoidal category C is called symmetric if there is a natural isomorphism uh, tau AB such that it takes uh, A tensor B and spits out B tensor A. And if you apply uh, this twice somehow, uh, then it shouldn't change anything. Mm. And again, with this technical difficulty, uh, because of this technical difficulty, I'm again cheating here and I'm just saying this, uh, it should again satisfy this coherence uh, uh, diagrams for both uh, associativity and unit. Um, Sorry, to, yes. uh, you have lost five minutes. Okay. Ah, ah, thank you. I have, I think, two more slides and I will be quite in time, hopefully. Uh, um, to, to summarize what we had so far, uh, we, had the, we had the category uh, with, and category had objects and, and morphisms between them. Uh, we have this category and we have this tensor product, which is a functor from C times C to C. Uh, for the monoidal structure, again, we have associator, we have left and right unitals. These are, again, nothing but uh, they are just representing this uh, isomorphic symbol, uh, but as a map. Uh, and we also have a twist map, uh, which is uh, representing the symmetric property of the tensor product. Um, so, with, um, yes, now I, I define a symmetric monoidal functor somehow. Um, a symmetric monoidal functor F from C to D between two symmetric monoidal categories C and D is a functor that respects symmetric monoidal structure, which means that you have, um, you have this symmetric monoidal structure, you have this tensor product for C, you have this alpha for C, you have this lambda and rho for C, and you have tau for C, and you have the same things for D. So this F should uh, respect the structure. We know that since it's a functor, it already respects the structure of, um, of morphisms and composition and ident identity. And from symmetric monoidal functor, we also respect that it, uh, we also require that it respects the twist map and, uh, and monoidal structure simply. Uh, I didn't draw these diagrams of it. I think diagrams sometimes make it even more complicated, but I will give one example of this symmetric monoidal functors. I hope this will be clearer there. And yeah, the definition, and it's also somehow example of symmetric monoidal functors. An n-dimensional closed topological quantum field theory is a symmetric monoidal functor Z from a uh, category of bordism classes with uh, disjoint union and empty set to category of vector spaces with tensor product and uh, underlying field K as a, a unit of the tensor product. So let's try to understand what this uh, functor does. So this functor takes uh, n minus one dimensional manifolds, uh, sigma, and maps them to some vector space, z of sigma. Um, and it also takes uh, morphisms of, 
this this category of bordism classes, namely n pheomorphism classes of n n dimension manifolds, and it creates a linear map between vector spaces. Yes, um, and since it's a functor, it should uh, respect the, the um, composition uh, of of uh, of morphisms. And composition of bordisms is, uh, as we defined before, is just cooling of manifolds. And so if I have a manifold M1 whose in boundary is sigma 1 and out boundary is sigma 2, and if I have another manifold M2 whose in boundary is sigma 2, out boundary is sigma 3, I can compose this. I can glue these two manifolds together as uh, M2 after M1. And this should be mapped, and this should be mapped to a linear map because Z of M2 after M1 is the linear map. It should be the same thing as uh, this linear map composed with this linear map. Again, here, this circle is a composition of manifolds, and this circle here is a composition of linear maps. And uh, another thing with another thing is. The topological cylinder sigma times zero one, uh, which is the identity morphism for sigma, is mapped to uh, the to the identity map of the vector space Z of sigma. Um, yes, so so th this cylinder is just mapping sigma to itself, and when I uh, when I apply the functor on it, I only get a, a identity map on the vector space Z sigma. And the last thing is the monoidal structure. Uh, if I take, um, I'm sorry, there is some, there's something coming on it. <laughs> I cannot see that. I guess if I take this joint union of two n minus one dimension manifold, sigma one and sigma two. Uh, I should get, uh, I get this vector space Z of sigma one tensor another vector space Z sigma two. And also, to be honest here, I should also write uh, the natural isomorphisms of these categories uh, because cut symmetric noidal category uh, board N is defined by uh, uh, disjoint union empty set associator and left and right unitors and also a twist map but i think they are uh, somehow clear so yes um, this is this was my last slide i forgot to write references here but the, there is references in my abstract in the booklet for this conference uh, thank you for listening and if there are any questions or comments, I would be happy to discuss them. Thank you so much for your presentation, Ekin. Also, I want to remind to our audience that Niels Karka will continue on this subject at today's class call. Uh, if you have questions, please that. I'm going to ask a question. Sure. <laughs> OK, thanks for the talk, Ekin. It was a very nice talk. I have two questions actually. Uh, one of which is, uh, I missed maybe why you called this a closed TQFT, first of all. Uh, where does the closeness come from? And uh, secondly, if, if you care to comment on this first, then I will ask my second question later because it is somewhat unrelated to this. Um... This is actually also a, a, a question for me too, because in literature, in, in some places, this definition is, is a like close topological quantum field theory. In, in other literature, they just define it as topological quantum field theory is this. But uh, we, okay, mm. let's go back to one of the, these pictures. So he, here in the beginning, um, this initial field configuration sigma in is mm -hmm. required to be a closed manifold, right? 
And in fact, um, as, I, as I think of it, in the, in the most general case, the sigma in can be taken to be the whole space itself, right? Uh, because like we take a special slice at time t0, so we can take this manifold to be a whole space time. Um, but uh, in this specific definition, we always require this n minus one dimension manifold to be closed. So I think that's the reason uh, in the literature, many people call it uh, closed topological quantum field theory. Have you seen anything like an open TQFD? <laughs> Just out of curiosity. Uh, no. Okay, uh, no. I can ask my second question. So you talked about locality and locality you told us about if you take two disjoint, um, even of two um, um, M minus one spaces, then the functor that you associated to will give a tensor product of the vector, respective vector spaces, right? Mm -hmm. You call uh, this locality. Not really, but, uh, <laughs> okay, maybe I missed that as well. Uh, um, yeah, I didn't talk about, I, I didn't say, I hope I didn't say uh, this joint union of, of these two. No, members, no, no, but I, mean, I said yes, okay. them. First okay, okay. So it, to a physicist mind, locality is more like, um, to, Causally connected, maybe. That's what I had in mind. Uh, out of physical uh, uh, needs. Uh, so if you have something like this, so a causal structure on top of your M's, um, this also requires a structure of metrics so and so forth. You haven't talked about this, but can you care to comment on this? Also physical locality of causal connectedness in terms of PQFTs, what does it mean? Uh, your, your question is, uh, this locality here represents locality on time or like causality, but what is the special locality or something like this? Yes, I mean, I'm causally connected in the space-time, four-dimensional space-time, I'm causally connected to a certain piece. I cannot reach the whole full space-time, right? Mm -hmm. So if I want to do a, a TQFT, my experiments would be, for instance, uh, the experiments that I would do in turn would be certain local experiments, right? Uh, maybe. Um, in, in terms of space, it is very difficult to talk about locality here, I think, because we are interested in the topological space, right? Like we, we, we cannot talk about like how, how close the things are. Um, because yes, like yes. if they are a little bit far from each other, it is homeomorphic to they are from the infinity. Uh, yes, yes. I mean, you don't have a metric structure or something like that. I just wanted to ask whether you had comments on it or not. Yes, I think I think here uh, locality on time we are talking about, or in other words, we are talking about causality. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm not sure if, if we can talk about locality in the space. Maybe we can ask this question again to Niels, or if maybe someone else wants to comment on it. Okay, thanks anyways. I mean, we can always discuss it later. Okay, are there any questions there? Okay, I guess not. So let's thank uh, our speaker again, and let's meet at sharp five. Uh, if our keynote speaker will speak. <laughs>